Hi folks, uh, my name is Bill Pollock, and I'm here with my guest Bob Fal Falcon, and uh, we're at the Peterson Museum in Los Angeles. It's November the 3rd, 2009, and uh, we'll explore a little bit about what you've been up to in the last 60 or 70 or whatever. How about 81? <laughs> How about, that's a good number. Should we go to Vegas and play it? No, uh, okay. no. I never think, I've actually, I've just got around to where I admit how old I am. Yeah, it doesn't bother me. You know. <laughs> but we did reach that pinnacle. Absolutely. And uh, we have spent a lifetime around automobiles because... Well, what was your first, what's, what's your first memory of... of my first memory is this picture here. That's me as a youngster in my father's you really are. Uh, Model T Franny single seat race car okay. Franny, that, that ran on fairgrounds dirt tracks in Pennsylvania. And that was my first ride on a race car, on a racetrack in a race car, sitting you on his a, you lap. You had a ride when you were like that little? Yeah, they'd sit me on his lap and away we'd go when, for warm ups. For warm ups. And my dad always stood on the gas. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so I got very used to that, and uh, and then this is the this is the car, the full full shot of the Franny at one of his shops, and mm -hmm. then they outlawed those cars, so he built another one. Well, he crashed it pretty bad too, and they built another one, which is it was a Rajo. Uh, the Rajo I remember well. Yeah, it's a Rajo, and that's the. Uh, I forget what they called that head, but it was just a th three valve, three valve, yeah, three valve Rajo. And then our family, you know, uh, uh, about in the '30s, they decided my dad wanted to get out of that place in Pennsylvania, and we de he decided we're going to relocate to California. Okay. Well, my mother had a sister living out here, and we drove across the country in that car, which. Dad had purchased it brand new in 1934. It's a 1934 Hupmobile with uh, a, oh, that yeah. was designed by Raymond Lowy. And they made that car with few changes on it. It was a very advanced car for its time. Let's see. Dad was a very bad welder. He cracked Hold it. Or Hupmobile, which had a Raymond Do Lowy designed body on the thing. And Lowy was noted for this may have been his first move at streamlining. You know, that's, coming up with a streamlined that's a, shape. That's a heck of a good-looking car for 1934, isn't it? Yeah, took us two weeks to come across the country, and <laughs> well, <laughs> on route six. Yeah, well, the roads. I mean, yeah, good well, Lord, I yeah, I, two or three-lane highway. I did hold. that in 1934 myself. <laughs> yeah, Lowy's the first time I became aware of a designer. Of, you know, that I think the, that was the, the same thing for all of us. You know. Yeah, I mean. He, the Studebaker ch champion with that little round bullet rocket nose. I mean, that, that was so far ahead of its time. Well, then he also come up with on the 53 Studebakers, he had that little, he did kind of the aerial rule on that, where they reduced the width of the body inside there to, just to cut down on noise, but it later came into play on jet aircraft. True, <laughs> true. And then, Very interesting, yeah. And so, uh, so what that's, we... that's, and actually, so I started my life with automobiles, uh, doing work on them, when I was perhaps 10 or 11 in my dad's shop. I started out uh, sweeping the floor, washing parts, that sort of thing, then graduated to taking wheels off, and he, had, he made a special lug wrench with me that was big so I could get them tight. And then I graduated to taking the wheel uh, and brake drum assembly off so he could balance the wheels. And then I think I was around 11, a little over 11, and he came up with a project for me. And back in those days, the rear axles on cars like Plymouths and some of the other cars, except Ford, because Fords are always very strong, but uh, they would bend. And my dad had a wheel alignment and brake shop, so he ended up with the, the uh, with the fixtures so he could straighten those things. So my first big automotive repair job was to remove the rear axle out of, a, I think, a 1936 Plymouth. And he straightened it, and then I put it back in again. It took me one day to take it out and one day to put it back in again. Good Lord. But that was the first thing, and then we went from there, you know. Okay, well, so then what happened? Well, then we got involved and we moved and 
actually our family we made two or three trips back here to California and somewhere in between I became very interested in aircraft <laughs> you know okay because in the 30s and and somewhere along the line, back when we were in Pennsylvania, the guy had owned a this particular airplane like this. What is which that? Which is a, with, that's a, uh, a travel air biplane, two hole. Yeah. Yeah, they were formerly mail planes, you know. And okay. this one, this picture happens to have a, a, uh, a round motor in it, you know. But a the radio. guy that I, I, that I flew with had a, either a OX5, or, which is an inline engine, V8, or a Hisso. That's a Hispano Suiza. Hispano Suiza, yeah. <laughs> Which is also a V8. And, okay. well, and I didn't know it was a V8, yeah, but they weren't they liquid? Were they air cooled engines? Uh, they were liquid cooled. Same liquid as the uh, OX5, I think, was yeah, liquid cooled. Yeah, I thought cooled so too. too. Yeah, that's a radio. That's a radio, that's correct. And the guy that owned the airplane, I guess he and my father shared at this little town we lived in at that time, it was 500 people. And they shared the label of the town crazy. My dad, oh. because he drove race cars, and this other guy, <laughs> because he flew, he flew airplanes. He used to work on it in his basement, take the wings off and put it in his basement at home to work on it during the winter. Anyway, so uh, he, he, the guy owed my dad a couple of bucks for something. And my dad says, tell you what, take the kid for a ride. I'll never forget, I, when we landed after we took off from a grass strip. He got her in the air, and he went right into a roll. <laughs> <laughs> and we did a bunch of aer aerobatics. Oh, Lord. Probably doing 40 miles an hour in that thing. <laughs> and when we landed, I looked around and thought, man, I'm going to learn how to do that. It took me a long time to finally get around to do it, but I finally did learn how to do that. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that was so I got very interested in aviation and spent a lot of time at the airports. Another interesting story because I got pretty much involved in Indianapolis, as we'll find out down the line, but I was back there one time, and I remember in those days, I'd ride my bicycle out to the airport at about 5 o'clock at night, and in would come this Stinson, a gullwing Stinson, a Reliant, and he would swoop down between these two poles, and he would hook on to a rope, and then they would, he would reel in a mail sack. <laughs> And I heard this friend, a guy who I got to know, uh, I call him Mr. Aviation, back in Indiana, talking to some guys in our, in our hotel room, and he said, yeah, well, and he mentions the guy, and it was the guy that started Allegheny Airlines. And he said, so-and-so called me up, he had this harebrained idea about going around all these little towns in western Pennsylvania and picking up the mail sex. And so I got him off to the side, and I said, Bo? Did you go to Connellsville, PA airport to pick up mail? He said, oh yeah, that was on the route. I said, do you remember a kid on a bicycle that would wave at you every time you <laughs> went by? And he said, Bob, every airport I went to had kids on bicycles waving at me. <laughs> so, so, so true, yeah, that's great. Yeah, so, yeah, and then uh, we settled down here. My dad opened up a shop in Culver City. Uh, right across from the Ford dealer down there and the Ford dealer Folger or no Fortner was a good friend of Clark Gables and every Saturday this is during World War II Gable who was stationed at the old Howell Road studio first motion picture unit would be there and use one of the Lubrax of Fortner Ford and do the servicing on his Lincoln Continental. Put on your coveralls. And he finally crashed it, and my dad and I got the chance to straighten the frame on it. <laughs> but uh, that was quite it. You know, one of my customers, I worked in a gas station there for a while. It was a big ga gas station. My dad had his shop in the back, but he leased the whole thing. And so I went to work for the guy that was running the gas station. And one of my customers that used to bring his absolutely gorgeous 40 Ford convertible in there and leave it to get fueled up or maybe lube it or change a tire or something like that was Captain Ronald Reagan. Oh. <laughs> That's exciting. That's great. Yeah. And then he would walk down the studio, you know. I love those 40 Fords, too. Hmm? Oh, it was just absolutely gorgeous. 41 was a piece of junk, but the 40 was. Yeah. Well, back in my hot rod days, because I got into that. Tell me. You know, well, because, you know, this was a place to be, and 
and I didn't do a lot of dry lakes racing, but I did do some, but none when I was in, in school. But I did end up the owner of a, of a 1931 Ford Roadster. No fenders or anything like that, with a, a crater head on a Model A block. Hmm. That car taught me automotive diagnostics. Boy, you know, because it was at the point where well, the Model A engine was from 1931, which was the last one, uh, to the 1940s. That's a long lifespan for them. Yes. And anytime you had a rod which were poured, reconditioned, they took away steel and poured it with Babbitt, and you ended up with things that were pretty squishy. So uh, we we'd had it went through a lot of trials and tribulations, and especially right after World War II, I was you know I was still in high school and had that car. And the way we did things, we didn't have a magazine to go to or ads to buy all the stuff that you need. We would go to Pally's Surplus downtown or any number of surplus stores around town and brainstorm and say, oh, I could use that on my roadster. And you buy it for a buck or two bucks. Yeah. That's Junkyards. Huh? Junkyards. Yeah, they, they were all aircraft surplus stores. Yeah. And uh, I remember one time it was having, uh, I built a spray system because I didn't, couldn't come up with the $8 it took to get the crankshaft drilled to go to, to a pressurized system. So I thought, I'll make a spray system. Chevy rod dips and all kinds of things like that. And, then, <coughs> and I bought this pump at uh, Pally's. Nice looking little compact pump. And I thought, you know, I can stick that right on the front uh, uh, timing gear cover and put a slot in the, ti- in, the cam- in the camshaft and I could drive that pump right off of the cam at half engine speed. So I take and I string all the lines and everything and the day I fired it up and I had to use like 50 weight oil on that car because it had solid skirt pistons and 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 it did t- oil temperature did get up there pretty high and kept the pistons from slapping so much. So I fired that thing up, and the next thing, my, I had this big 100-pound uh, oil, oil pressure gauge, Stuart Warner, about that size, and I watched the needle go runk all the way over, hit the peg, bend in two. <laughs> 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 and the next thing I know is the, the glass got broken out and it's spraying all the oil in my face. <laughs> like oh, oil, the like, pump oh, worked. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I get out, get the engine shut off. And I go out and I look and all my lines and I'd put her all blown off. Oh my! Well, I found out that was about a three thousand psi pump. <laughs> <laughs> so oh. I got a book and read up on uh, pressure relief valves. <laughs> <laughs> then I started foaming the oil because I had put so much back in the sump. But you know, you learn the things. That's what, that was hot rodding. That was less. That was that was less than one oh one, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, but then. Uh, so my dad had a shop, uh, and it was a pretty busy front end shop by that time on, on Washington Boulevard, right across from MGM Studios, and uh, right, uh, Motor Avenue in Washington. And, I know exactly where that is. Yeah, and uh, we, you know, and I got to be good friends with a guy that had a speed shop down on Washington Place named Carl Orr. In fact, our family at that time lived within a couple blocks, and I spent a lot of time over at his house, too. But uh, Carl and Vita Orr. Well, Vita was the first lady that was ever licensed to drive at the dry lakes. Oh. Legally. And she she did a little booklet called All on Dry Lakes Racing, and she did two issues of it. And she banged it out on a typewriter and had pictures stuck in it. I think she sold them for a quarter apiece or something like that, maybe a dime. But she gave me one copy of them because I was always down at the shop. And I put it away, and I found it, you know, about the same time I heard about Throttle Magazine, which was an old uh, hot rod magazine that was published by a guy here. He did it one year uh, in 1941. And then he went in the military, and it just, he disappeared. He went into something else. I can't remember his name now. But they found every issue of it, and they reissued it, a rotting journal magazine, reissued it as a booklet, as a book, the whole 12 months of it, 
And of course, Peterson did the same thing years ago, so I had a copy of that. And I have Vita's booklet, and on the same shelf in my bookcase, I also have <coughs> volume one, number one, of Hot Rod Magazine. Oh. And the guy this building is named after. That's right. Was working at that time at MGM in the PR department. And he used to stop by my dad's shop from time to time. All those guys used to park out on Washington Boulevard, and they would cross the, cross Washington. There was no sidewalk on the south side, and walk up the sidewalk where they go in the uh, gate one. And he would stop by because I, you know, I either had my roadster. Or we always had interesting cars there, you know. And he would stop by and look at some of the cars and everything. And one day he comes up to me, he says. He said, "You know, you're the, you got a you're loose son, right?" And I said, "Yeah." And he said, "Well, you got you got a roadster, don't you?" And he said, "Here's this book. We just I just started. I'm going to start printing this book. Here, take it and read it. Let me know what you think of it." <laughs> well, they cost a quarter, <laughs> so uh, I still got that copy he gave me. Wow. I mean, the, the the staples rusted in it, but I still have that copy, and uh, amazingly. He had a feature in there called Parts with Appeal. Do you remember that? The girl that was in the first issue, I went to high school with. She was <laughs> holding a fuel pump. <laughs> anyway, that was, uh, so I got into, uh, at that time, I come home from work one day, and because uh, I'd work at my dad's shop sometime, but I also worked at a gas station, and I worked a lot on that, on that Craigar trying to keep it running. <coughs> and he says, have you uh, stopped by to see what John Kelly's doing? And I said, I don't know John Kelly. He said, well, you know, he's got that garage right up the street from us on the corner of Washington and Alinda Avenue in Culver City, right by Culver City Grammar School. And he said he's got something going on. You ought to stop in and see. So that evening on the way home from closing the gas station, I parked it on the street, didn't go. He had a real steep driveway. went up and it was a little two-car or two-bay garage that had the doors that opened out. So I go up there and there's one guy inside working, inside of this roadster body. The lights are on, there's nobody else there and I, good sense prevailed and I didn't walk into the place, I just stood at the threshold. And I'm just kind of looking around, figuring out what he's done. He was building some kind of a roadster. And pretty soon he says, hey guy, could you hold this wrench for me? So I go inside. <laughs> And we get to talk, and he finds out who I am. And after we get whatever he was doing done, he says, would you mind sticking around a while and maybe sawing some angle iron for me and <laughs> doing this and doing that about midnight? <laughs> he says, well, we've got to quit. Can't work anymore tonight. Thanks a lot for your help. See you tomorrow night. <laughs> so there I was, probably in 10th grade in high school. And I worked in the evenings after I got off my other job, and I helped this guy build a track roadster. Then I was working on the crew of that thing. And we had a great big tall guy that had something to do with mufflers that was right down by Carl, Carl R's Speed Shop. And this guy stopped in one time and he, and he says, Johnny, you know, I want to, can I use one of your bays up there? I want to build a track roadster. And, and Johnny says, yeah, okay, Sandy, you can do that. In fact, Bob will help you. So I helped <laughs> Sandy Milan build a track roadster. <laughs> <laughs> in the 10th grade. So that's why I never did a lot of, of, of lakes racing is because I was just busy working on the cruise. I mean, Johnny ran it, and there was four different organizations that raced track roadsters mm -hmm. here in L.A. After, right after World War II. And so I'm working CRA with Sandy and another group of Tony Caldwell group, I think it was American Sports Cars, with, uh, with Johnny. So... That kept me busy and going out of town up to Bakersfield and you know. And Johnny Kelly was a real taskmaster, but Sandy was too. You come back from the racetrack, cars loaded with mud, it's three o'clock in the morning, <laughs> you wash the car before it went to shop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, so I uh, uh you know, I did that until uh, I think it was nineteen forty Seven, I joined the Navy. I figured, you know, I'd already figured it out by that time. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, my goal in high school was to get out of high school, period. Okay? I'm going to join the Navy and I'll learn some trade or something that's going to help me to build race cars. 
and I'll have that good in shorts, the good GI in shorts, mm -hmm. right? And then when I get out, after my four years, or my three years, I guess that's what I joined for, uh, <coughs> after the three years, I'm going to build myself a race, get a job somewhere, build myself a race car, and go race it in CRA. That's what I thought about doing. Well, so when did you join the Navy? 1947. I didn't go in until 1948. October 7th, 1948 to be exact. <laughs> mm. And uh, I was supposed to go to submarine school. And, uh, you know, potential race drivers, we would always go for the risky <laughs> things, right? Of course. <laughs> and, and so... Uh, I end up down there in San Diego, and pretty soon it gets down to where we're in the recruit transfer unit. Ends up with one of those one of those barracks. You know, the they had four four different dormitories in the barracks that held about eighty people. There's two of us living in that thing, waiting for our orders. Everybody else had left, and we had to clean that thing every Friday, <laughs> and a tile floor so we had to scrub. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's the military life. And finally, I got my orders, and I, and it was to go on the USS Dixie, that was anchored in San Diego Bay, which was a destroyer tender. Destroyer tender is like the race car shop for destroyers. Okay, yeah, they could do anything you need to get done. Perfect. But I'm in a deck force. Oh. <laughs> And the Dixie had wooden decks, <laughs> wooden oh. weather decks, which means that I think I'd been on board the Dixie three weeks, and we up came the anchor, and we headed for Tsingtao, China. <laughs> and somewhere along the line, the bosun mate decided time to holy stone the decks, and so I did get a couple of days in a holy stoning. And then, you know, I'm thinking. I need to get out of this. This this is not what I joined the Navy for. I didn't want to learn housekeeping. My mother did a good job of that, you know. And uh, I was washing paintwork one day and went by the uh, shop, I think it was the blacksmith shop, and there was a chief and a bunch of uh, white hats there, and they're needling the chief because he couldn't get a striker, which is an apprentice, in his shop. And I don't know how or what I said, but I'm, all of a sudden I'm, I'm involved in that. They're, I mean, these guys are jumping on me, too. And finally, this chief says, hey, guy, have you ever worked in a shop? And I said, yeah, I worked in my dad's uh, repair shop. He said, do you want to go to work for me in my shop? I said, yeah. <laughs> so he said, come on with me. And we go up to the, to the division, to the d repair division office, and he introduces me to the, to our, to the uh, uh, commander of the, of the, or the, what the hell do they call him? The guy that's in charge of that department, the department head. And... He said, this guy wants to be my striker. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, we got this one guy in our division that's a big pain in the neck, and what we're going to do is we're going to swap him to the deck <laughs> to the deck force. <laughs> and, you know, there's somebody up there that's been watching <laughs> over me all the time because here I am working in a pipe shop uh, of, a, uh, of a repair ship, of a tender, and in the same area, in the same compartment, is the blacksmith shop, a heavy metal shop, sheet metal shop. There's a little door that goes into the welding shop, and a, just one compartment forward is a is a foundry. That's and you have amazing. more time than you have money. <laughs> yeah. What a place to be, to to learn all the little things you need to know about building a race car. Yeah. Well, I never even took a course in drafting, okay? So we're over somewhere, and one of the guys, one of the, one of the molders, the guy in the foundry, owned a Model A Ford. I said, I got an idea. Why don't we make an aluminum head for your Model A Ford? <laughs> he said, oh, I said, we'll put fins on it, you can polish it. We'll put your name down the middle of it, just like you. <laughs> he says. Yeah, let's do that. So I said, he said, how are you going to make it fit? I said, I'll get, a, I'll get a friend to send me a head gasket. So I wrote a letter to a friend of mine back here in the States, and he f 
He sent me a head gasket. That showed me where all the valves are, all the studs are, and everything. And I had a pretty good memory of you know how the model of your engine was. And I went ashore. Uh, it must have been in Japan at that time. And I bought a, dra a drafting set. The guys in the carpenter shop made me a drafting table, or drafting board. And I started making drawings. And I didn't know anything about <laughs> engineering drawings. <laughs> but I made you know, detailed drawings so that we built the patterns. We built the core boxes. We made the cores. And every time that they would do a pour of, a, of metal, of aluminum, in the shop, and they had two rocking art furnaces, he and I would ram up their sand casting. So we'd have to do a, get a flask and we'd use our patterns and we'd ram them up, maybe two or three of them, and then cut them all apart, take a look to make sure everything is, all the metal's getting there, and we finally made two of them. Wow. And I took the two that we decided to use and I went down to the machine shop and they checked me out on the, <laughs> on the, uh, on the milling machine and and surface grinders and all that kind of stuff and and I did the machining you know drilled the holes and I don't know how it worked because he and I separated because <laughs> I broke my ankle and we ended up in the hospital but <laughs> but uh, uh, and I had never run across him before but he took it home to put it on his Model A I didn't know anything about heat treating <laughs> <laughs> so he might be mad at me. <laughs> But they did, uh, I'll tell you what, the division officers for his division, that was the fourth division, ours is the fifth, they got so engrossed in the project that when it was time for us to make our, and you know, these electric arc furnaces, so you gotta have a, 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 some kind of a slip, a voucher that lets them, lets you turn on those furnaces because of the, of the electrical power on board ship. And to get and to draw any good aluminum, otherwise you use scrap, you know, and regrind. So we got a chit to cover the electricity, so we could have a special pour of our stuff. Mm -hmm. And we got a chit to get virgin aluminum. I mean, this was because they were. Ever, I mean, I'd be drawing away on that thing, and I'd look up, and it'd be the captain of the ship is looking over my shoulder. What I'm doing? <laughs> it's a big ship, 500 people on it. <laughs> So, so tell me, uh, when did you get into a race car? I got into a race car after I got out of the Navy. Okay. Which I got was? Actually, I got into a race car because we used to warm up. Before we go to the racetrack, we'd always fire up one of the roadsters on the street. Yeah. And, and I got on a racetrack and learned how to start one of those things, because they're all push starts, you know. Yeah. On, uh, on Alinda Avenue in Culver City. <laughs> We'd get her going, stand on the gas and roar her down, crank it, get a little bit sideways and go back up the street. <laughs> we went to an intersection where we could do that. And, uh, but I actually got into a race car when I, when I got out of, uh, was discharged in the Navy after, about 1952. I was helped, jalopy racing had taken off in, down at Culver City Speedway every Sunday afternoon on TV. And I got to help on a guy that I knew uh, from high school who had a jalopy, and I got to helping him with that thing. And, and as a result, he would let me go out and warm it up, and then got to where he let me race, race it in the hooligan. And my, I'll never forget my first race. I'm going to start up, and they reached to the start the hooligan three abreast, <coughs> and, and these are all the guys that were all trying to learn. And three abreast and they would go around that quarter mile track over halfway down the back straightaway. A lot of cars, okay? And I'm gonna blow them all off. Okay, so right. I start in the middle of the front row, ended up on top of the fence, upside down. <laughs> no, I guess I wasn't upside down. I was, I was teetering on top of the grant fence at the middle of the back straightaway of the first lap. <laughs> Not too bad. Uh, didn't you know? Didn't bend the car that bad, and got her straightened out. And, and then later, I managed to get a, a pick up a couple of rides on my own. And, uh, and, and I, the first time I ever got upside down in that thing was a, at a half mile track in Riverside, called De Anza Speedway. It's where Rex Mays learned how to drive a race car. I've, I've heard of De Anza. Uh, it was a dusty place. 
I mean, it was the dust was so bad, my goggles leaked, I couldn't see, and I, I couldn't see anything anyway. And it was difficult to keep my eyes open, and I just ran out of racetrack and hit the fence, and I got upside down. Up again, he, this guy watching out for me, okay? You know how when you get upside down, it gets deathly quiet. It's the first time that I ever got upside down, and there is no sound. There is no feeling of motion or anything. I remember I had a hold of the wheel, and I let go to reach down to unfat. I thought we were stopped to unclasp my seatbelt, and my hand went up in the air, which means we were upside down. <laughs> and I let, we landed on the top, and the, some of the jalopies in those days, when they guys didn't build them, they converted a junk car into one. They didn't even take the wood out of it. And I remember something whacking me on the sh on my bicep of my left hand arm really bad, and it was a piece of a wood that swung down that was attached with metal. It swung down. It was about the size of a baseball bat, and I mean that was the thing that really hurt. Besides, I couldn't see. But if I would have unfastened that belt, that would have dropped me out, and that car would have landed right on top of me. Well. The car was sponsored by this local Culver City Studebaker dealer, whose name was Walt Cash. And Walt Cash got out of trust with his bank, and, and I'd been there before talking to the, the guy that owned the car was this lube man, and he had a pretty one of the mechanics there who used to work for a, a guy that ran, ran about three off he midgets, so he was a pretty good engine man. He was did the engine work on it. And I'd been there when uh, on on a certain day, and the the, the uh, <coughs> service manager come and say, "Hey, you guys, get across the street, everybody, get across the street, and get in a car and drive it over and park it at another place." We were shifting cars from one storage lot to another storage lot because the bank examiner was there. The guy that was taking him around, the, sir, the sales manager, would get t con him into going to lunch, and while he was at lunch, would move these cars, and they'd stick into the label on them. <laughs> <laughs> and they got a guy, a bank examiner, that wasn't hungry, <laughs> and he went over, and, and there weren't enough cars, according to his records, and so he's out of trust. And uh, they, they padlocked the place. So... You know, you understand that what yeah. it gets yeah. out of trust, and he padlocked the place, and so uh, my my car owner decided he was getting out of the racing game. He said, I'll "Tell you what, you already crashed the car, keep it." <laughs> so I took what parts I could use on it, and I thought, "I'm going to build a really good car. I'm going to do it the right way." I'd already built two real race cars, so I'm not going to take and convert something. So I'm going to build one. So what I did was, I think it's in here, oh, that's old shoehorn, I've got a picture of it here somewhere. I actually sat down and started out with a piece of paper, but now I'd already taken a drafting course, I knew how to do it. Oh yeah, you were a designer. <laughs> and, and I drew, and I drew this little 32, I didn't have a body for it times. I don't even know where I got the frame, but I looked in the rule book and I built a car according to the holes in the rule book. <laughs> there was no rule against having a bent frame. My dad's got a frame rack, so I bent the frame the way that I wanted it. And a lot of guys were doing that, and they'd build, bend it down at the firewall till it was till it was about that far above the ground, and that gets a pretty low CT. Yeah. But that put the, an upslope, and that puts you the cross member, so your spring is like this, and so you've got about 45 degrees of caster. That's no good, so I bend it down so it's straight. So it's got a Z in it, right? Well, it shortened up the wheelbase a little bit. <laughs> that helps. And did a whole bunch of stuff. I decided, well, I'm, since I'm, if I've got to do anything to support this frame, that's the best place to add weight, so I did box the frame in and cut lightning holes in the boxing material. And we're, the, the best roll bars that the people, a lot of guys, I've, I've seen that one that's up at the NHRA Museum, 
and they use sewer pipe in there for a roll cage. You know, uh, steel yeah. sewer pipe, which is dumb. But I actually went out and went just to the uh, metal yard, and I bought uh, 4130, uh, eighth wall, one-eighth wall, 4130 uh, uh, tubing. Yeah. And, and, you know, I learned to weld, so I didn't trust my welding. But we took it out to the track. We were running at Long Beach then, another organization. And the idea of taking it down to Long Beach was to turn it over to another guy who was going to paint the car. So I told my dad, I said, you know, Dad, we've been building this thing a long time. So I'm going to go, go out hot lapping with it in case there's anything going to fall off. That's the best time for it to fall off. So we go out, and man, I'll tell you, that sucker really handled good. I mean, it ran good. It handled good. I could put it anywhere, even when the truck was heavy. I could put it anywhere I wanted to. I could switch grooves in the middle of the corner when you're going sideways from the high groove to the low groove and the other way around. You just had Amazing. all this kind of stuff in it. And one of the things I had done is that because the steering gears were hard to get a hold of and they were bolted to the frame, so I put the steering wheel right dead center in the car and ran, uh, used a power takeoff joint like Curtis was using on the Indianapolis cars at that time over to the steering box. And so I could sit there, and with that slopey hood, I could look at both front wheels. It was like driving a real race car. So you could really maneuver it, you know. So we go out, and I told my dad, I said, you know, nothing's falling off, and everything seems to be okay. I'm going to go out and take one qualifying lap. Let's see how fast we can go. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. So we go out and we do the, because you did, your routine was you do one qualifying lap, and then you come back and do whatever you had to do, got back in line, and then you did two qualifying laps. So you're fastest of the three. It was where you started the race. Fastest 16 were in the main event. That's the only way you could get in the main event. And the next fastest were in the semi. And everybody else was in a hooligan. And we had, like even at Long Beach, we had like 150 cars that showed up every Sunday. So it's pretty tough racing. Uh, so I go out and we do our, do our qualifying lap and come in. We got fast time. I said, wow. I said, well, I'll tell you what. Let's go. <laughs> Let's check her over. We'll take it out, and we'll see if we can get fast time again. And if we damn, we'll just we'll just withdraw it, put it up on the trailer, because that's that's we know enough. He says, "Good idea." So we go out there, and I take the on the line. coming out of the uh, the north turn, right on the edge of the cushion, and the wheels were cranked a little bit that way, and coming up to the start finish line, and they had a. Uh, a full regulation football field in the infield at, at Veterans Memorial Stadium. And we were, the start finish line was at the 50 yard line. So when we got at about the north 40 yard line, we, we go boom like that and the steering wheel goes all the way over. Uh oh. <laughs> Wheels are turned. It hits a gate that somebody forgot to latch. <laughs> And we go through that gate and catch a 12 by 12 support for the crash wall dead center on the car. Uh -oh. And up she goes up in the air. That was my second time up in the air. <laughs> and, and it comes down on top of the crash wall on, on its top. And the guy up there again looking out for me. My hand got off of the steering wheel, it was sticking out through the top, and that part wasn't, wasn't underneath the car. <laughs> Went back out on the racetrack and endoed, end over end, the rest of the length of the straightaway and ended up in the end zone. And there she is. <laughs> That's my dad shedding tears. This is an old Polaroid. Doesn't That's me sitting bad. right there. Huh? Yeah, it doesn't look that bad. But you look at that, notice that roll cage is all? Yeah. At, um, so the well's held? The, everything, yeah. And it was a good little car. Then that I straightened it out, and that's how it straightened out. Wow. Yeah, good looking little car. Yeah, and it was lighter what than you, a feather. What was the power in it? A flathead Ford. Flathead? Yeah, 21 yeah. stud flathead Ford. And, you know, and we all did, that's later on, but yeah. we all did. Uh, we all did things like uh, we used the, the uh, 32 cam 
which yeah. is about like a three-quarter cam. Uh, we we did the uh, and we would lag it. We would retard the cam, which gives you a lot of top end. And we all used, you had to use the fuel pump, but we would take and change the spring in the fuel pump with one that came in a drive shaft repair kit that was the same, except your fuel pressure, you change it and put it in your pump and your fuel pressure went from two and a half to three pounds to six pounds. And then we would set, we would use the number, model 48 Stromberg carburetor. And of course we mill the heads. And uh, of course Ford didn't have any degrees on that, no flywheel degrees. So you would keep, you'd run, you'd advance the spark and then run the engine up and back off and you did it until it popped. <laughs> when it got a pop, you were right on. <laughs> So, yeah, that's and that was a it was a good little car. I sold that car to a guy because I'd gone off and, and and that's when they started Triple R. Remember Triple R? Yes. And Joe Plan, my dad used to help Joe Plan uh, on his various. Well, Joe cars. was in Culver City also. Hmm? Joe was in Culver City also. Yeah, he was in Culver City too. He rented a shop. <clears throat> he had one shop in Culver City and one closer down to Venice. Yeah. And he rented the one in Culver City. My dad built that building there and and that's where Joe kept his when he was when he got his Porsches, that's where they ended up. They mostly kept his Porsches in there like a race car shop. Yeah. And but uh he uh uh what did I start to say? I forgot what I was saying, but uh let's take a break here for a second. Do you want to shut it off? Okay. Rolling? All right. Um I I'm curious, you know Somewhere along the line, you you wound up in at uh, Indy and in IndyCar racing or something to do with it. Yes, I did. But uh, on, before I got into IndyCar racing, as I mentioned, uh, Joe Plan was involved in starting Triple R. Right. And one day he says, "You ought to join this organization. We're going to run for prize money. Hey, where, where are you going to run? Anywhere where they'll have us." So I said, "Okay." I had a friend that had a single guy that had three cars. He had an MGTD. He had a remember the old when the CHP used to use the old Oldsmobile coupes. Yeah, he had one of them, a <laughs> cop car, and he had a '55 Burt. So I bought a took him out. He's an old ex Marine from from China too, and so we went and had a couple of brews, and I decided and, and and I convinced him that we should take the MG just sitting there. Let's take it up. We'll bring it up to shop. We'll lighten it up. We'll do a few things to it, and we'll go out and race it and make a buck or two, at least enough to buy a couple beers. He's all for it, okay? And so we did. So we, we took that little MG, and uh, we raced it. We did very good with it on the ovals. We didn't do very good with it on the, on the, on the uh, road courses because of the long straightaways, you know? How fast will an MG yeah. go down the straightaway? Not but they did fast. get me in some traps at Willow at 100 and a quarter in that thing. That's pretty good. It's not bad at all, but I found something to put in the fuel. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh. always thinking, you know, oh. That's, oh. The, that's what it's all about, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll tell you some of the tricky thing. Then, and this is that car here. This is the only picture I have of the car in action, and that was up at Willow. And I got that from Stephanie Huth. She called me up and said, I think I got a picture oh, you're looking for. Stephanie. And she says... Well, it looks like that guy is really passionate. I said, Stephanie, take a close look. That guy's out in the dirt. Yeah. I'm on the pavement. Guess how he got in the dirt? That guy there is looking to see how how good of a job he did. <laughs> because where I come from, you learn, you teach the guy in front of you how to make a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> the TD wasn't a bad little car. No, I loved it. You know that thing? It's a Bud hand. I, uh, I, Bud loaned me the the roll cage. Okay. And. Uh, we took, you can see, we took the spare tire thing. All we we took a lot of weight out of the car, and of course, the first thing we did pulled all four shocks off, dumped all the oil out of them, and then refilled them with 50 weight non detergent oil, which stiffened things up. Oh. And then we for the ovals because I knew how to transfer the weight around and everything. We had a little lowering block that we put in, uh, on the on the left rear. Yeah. And. Uh, on the right front, I'd use those aluminum things you put between the coils. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> so I, know I could transfer some weight around. Yeah, I But you know the, the guy, I used to drive, the guy that had the offie, 
this was in 1954, I think we were doing this. But uh, a guy, I can't remember his name, he ran an office special in Triple R. And years later, uh, he came up to me when I was working for Halibrand, and he was working for Ted, briefly. And he come up to me on a, a coffee break one day. I'm sitting outside with some guys, and he come up and he says, can I talk to you a minute? I said, yeah. So I went over. He said, aren't you the guy that used to drive a little MGTD? And I said, yeah, in Triple R? Yeah. He said, you were the hardest SOB in the racetrack to pass. <laughs> <laughs> I said, but he said, you know, I had a faster car than you. You should have moved over. I said, not where I came from. <laughs> the first one you earn. After they said, yeah, after I passed you one time, you tell me where to go. <laughs> I said, that's what it was in my game. Yeah. <laughs> that's what we learned. And I said, he said, well, why would you want to do that? You knew I had a faster car. And I said, because in my mind, one of those times it was going to take you 30 laps to do it, and I was going to win. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of the guy's name right now, but he was an yeah, I remember, Rocky, I remember the car. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, it was a great little car. It was yeah. really a great little car. And yeah, I had uh, one. I never raced it. Yeah. We beat, actually, at Benelli Stadium up in Saugus, that third of a mile flat track. We were second fastest qualifier, and they did a straight up start. Yeah. And we, we had to go out and qualify one car at a time. And we were second by a hundredth of a second to a to a Porsche Speedster, that one with the little tiny windshield. Yeah. And so I, t my, uh, I told my owner, I said, uh, I'm going to have to try something, so don't be surprised at what I do. <laughs> so we go out, and, and we get all lined up for the heat, for the, actually run the production cars as a heat, and the, and <coughs> the modified as a heat, then they put the both together, inverted for a... Uh, uh, for the, your main event or semi-main. And so I said, don't be surprised at what I do. So I go out there and Al, Al uh, what was the starter's name? Oh, uh, Torres. Al Torres, yeah. Uh, he's the starter. So we come down for the start, and I'm on the outside of the front row. And when he gets ready to wave the green flag, that Porsche jumps out, and I just backed off. <laughs> So it's a no start, right? And we did that about three times, and Al was shaking his flags at me and all that stuff, and I pointed to the engine and went, like, what do you expect? <laughs> so I come around again, and he goes, and he points to me, and he, like that, in other words, wanted me to set the pace. So we're going down the back straightaway. I'm up in, I'm in first gear or second gear, keeping the engine revved up, and that Porsche is sitting next to me and it's going kaboom, kaboom. I can smell the fuel. I figure out to get that guy loaded up. <laughs> and when he gets on the gas, it's going to stop. You know, and all I need yeah. to do is get in front of him. He'll never get around me. And, and by God, we come down to the line and I got to jump on him because he stumbled, but he still passed me before we got to the first turn. So I figured, oh well. I guess we'll run second to him. There's a bunch of other Porsches in the whole field, too. Uh -huh. that, uh, and we stuck with him for the full, I think it was a 15-lap race. And we stuck with him. And on the la and we'd, get a, we'd get almost around him. We'd get right up next to him, going through that flat corner on the outside. And, uh, and then he, once we got pointed straight, he was gone. I mean, the goggles coming off my head, you know. And... Uh, <laughs> On that last lap, we got the white flag or whatever they told you in that group, and so we got almost in front of him. We got like half a car length, you know, past him in that south turn at Benelli, and that kind of pinched him coming out of the corner. I go over to the wall to, to make the, you know, to make the straightaway a little bit longer and everything, and he's running down on the inside, and when he went into the north turn, he cranked her in too hard, and he got the back end around too far. We come off the wall, zipped right by him. We beat him by about 10 car lengths, and I remember coming out of the corner. I mean, I couldn't believe that we had really pulled it off like we did, and coming out of the corner, I saw a bullet Joe Garson was out there with, uh, with oh Whitey. Oh, my. And he's there, and his jaws hanging down, his eyes are big. Like he couldn't believe what he was watching, you know. And uh, 
Actually, we, we, we got her around and uh, we've gotten a good spot. And as you know, when you're doing very well, you can do anything you want to the car and there's a lot of people that will copy you. <clears throat> and that's what we did with that, this MG. Everybody, all the other people with MGs or in the class were looking at what we did with tires and all that stuff. Yeah. And we'd leave it sit in the pits, pits that way and then roll it out in the racetrack and change the tires all around. <laughs> so tell me what... When did you go? When did you get to Indy? And well, okay. A after, after this, that. I'd gone to you know, college and that sort of stuff, and uh, I think I was working for a diesel engine company in their engineering department and doing all their technical manuals out in out in Inglewood. We were developing an opposed piston design diesel outboard motor, and uh, and we nobody could lift it. No, a little tiny thing, lighter than a feather. Oh. No, lighter than a feather. We made two versions of it. One of them that was a bigger one that was for the outboard, and one that was only about that big. The piston was about that long, hmm. and it had two crankshafts and two pistons that went like that. Wow. And uh, we, that we used for a generator set that we sold to the Marine Corps. And uh, so uh, I was the, the, the people at, at that company, uh, Dennis Kendall was the president of it, it was called American Mark. And he decided to get into the boat business. He started buying up boat companies. Next thing I know, I'm working in marine stuff, too. And, and as an advertising manager, I didn't know anything about that crap. Well, I learned fast. But I ended up moonlighting with a, uh, a boating magazine that came out with Hot Boat Magazine, the, fir the first uh, book they came out with. And... Uh, I ended up uh, there, and they were, were putting together the first issue of Hot Boat Magazine, and they wanted to, uh, uh, get, we were, so everybody, if you worked there, everybody sold ads, right? And the, the pu publisher one day was saying, boy, he said, you know, would love to get Halibrand, Halibrand Engineering to get an ad, an ad in this magazine, because I said, well, they make race car parts. He says, no, 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 no. They make a whole line of uh, marine V-drives, too. I said, oh, oh, I'll go give it a stab. I know Ted Halibrand. I had met him when I was in high school. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> he was down the street from my dad's shop. And my dad used to do some work for him. And actually, my dad's shop got picked up in an advertisement in a car magazine as being a manufacturer of quick-change rear ends when Ted was first starting. And one day my dad says, oh, there's another one of those damn letters. And he's thrown it. I said, what is it? And he said, oh, people writing in asking us about our quick change rear end. We don't make them. I said, don't throw any more away. Give them to me. And so on Wednesday night, I, uh, when I had gathered some up, I would go down to Halibrand's, which is down the shop, because anybody that was in town to race at Gilmore on Thursday was in his place on Wednesday night. You know, and I'd go down and find Ted. And introduce myself and give him these Come letters. On, let's, I want you to get to the point here. Okay, okay, we're going to get to it. So I knew Ted pretty today, good. huh? <laughs> today. Well, I had to tell you that because that's how I well, knew him. Okay. So I go out there to sell the ad, and and the toughest thing to do was get past his office manager, and she said Ted's not here. He's out uh, out running errands or something. So I said, oh, okay. So he was on Maryland Avenue then. So. Uh, and this was 1963. And so I'm walking out. I said, okay, I'll try and call him later or something. And as I'm walking out, I hear somebody coming down the steps. And look up, it's Ted. So I said, oh, hi, Ted, or hi, Mr. Halibrand, or whatever it was. And he remembered me. And we shake hands. He says, come on up. What are you, what are you, what are you doing? I said, I need you here to try to sell you an ad. And he said, so we go upstairs to his office, in the engineering department in his office. And he says, oh, okay, you're working for a magazine. What have you been doing? And he asked me all about what I'm doing. So I was in the military and in the Navy and blah, blah, blah. He said, uh, do you ever do any uh, work on the side, you know, uh, artwork and things like that? I said, yeah. He said, would you mind doing work for me? I said, no, I'd be happy to. So he said, okay. <laughs> I'll take the ad. I, what, what part would be, which one would be best? I said, back cover. He said, okay. <laughs> we can do the layout. I said, yeah, I'll do the layout. Don't worry about it. Great. So I love it. from that day on, we became very, very close friends. And I did a lot of work for him. And I worked in a lot of other places at the same time I was working with him. 
because he didn't have enough to keep me busy all the time. And that's where I met Norman Timms. And I remember I was down here one night at his at that shop in, on Maryland Avenue, and, and and it was in like November of 1963. And I'm looking for some photos in his files for something we were going to do a catalog or something. And Ted is over there talking to this guy who came in with a roll of drawings on his arm, and. They got these drawings spread out there, and Ted says, "Hey, Bob, come over here. I'm gonna want to show you something." So I go over, and it's the it's the body layout for the Halibrand Shrake race car, the rear engine car. And he said, "You know, these these hammer and pound body men are going to get really angry at us because, you know, this is a, a monocoque structure, so it's all part of the it's all part of building right. the building process. You nose and a tail. That's all you got." And he introduced me to, to Norm Timms, who was hmm. a gifted designer, by the way. And uh, and so, what he, what they were, this is a, the Eddie Sachs car. It was my first year in Indianapolis. Oh my! And this is a replica that we built of it after the crash. Huh? And uh, remember Eddie Sachs? This is taken down in the killed. basement of the museum. So it was through Halibrand that I that I got my first trip back to Indianapolis, 1964. Uh, did all of the uh, uh, follow-up on the Sachs McDonald accident, mm. and uh, yes, I remember that was a terrible crash. Oh, really? It was. Well, you know, but a lot of people. We had fuel tanks on both sides of the car, down the length of it. Yeah. Plus, we had uh, on on the uh, on the inside, on the left side, we had an external tank too, because you were allowed 75 gallons in those days. And we had these four and a half gallon cells that went from on the on the on the monocoque. Uh huh. And but in between, we had the uh, swing trick belts, so that because when you jump on the brakes or decelerate for the corner, you know, and all that fuel would spill forward and upset everything. So we put check valves in there, and uh, I got to where I was working very close with Norm Timms. In fact, when we were building those cars. I was working somewhere else, and I would pick him up at six o'clock at night, and we would drive down to Torrance, where they were building them, and uh, go work on because everything on this car was documented, and we would uh, doing the documentation. In fact, I remember he was doing the layout on the on the uh, on the suspension, and I said, you know, Norm, one thing you have to watch out for on these things is that because you, you know, American car builders at that time didn't know anything about independent suspension, no. the geometry. I said, you got to keep that upper arm and that tie rod from the rack and pinion so that they, so the ends move over the same arc. Because they said, well, how do you know that? I said, because 1949 Fords had a terrible time with bump steer. <laughs> well, we called it relative alignment then. On the right front wheel, they wear out a tire in 10,000 miles. Because they reloc they located the idler arm bracket in the wrong place, so we would take and move that bracket, you know, file it and the hole and move that bracket, and then we could bounce the car with a tow engage, and we could see that it doesn't move. He says, "Yeah," and you know, on top of that, it looks better that way. <laughs> that was Norm <laughs> Tim's. Okay, so that got me into Indianapolis. So uh, Norm and I uh, in '65, '66, we built those cars. Because this is when they were changing from the roadsters to the rear engine cars in Indianapolis. Everybody was trying something. And we built uh, those. And we, in, in 1965, we built, I think it was seven of them, between the middle of January and the middle of April. And shipped them. That's, I don't think anybody ever done that before. So Ted decides for 66... He put Tim's and I together as a design team, and this is, we took the 65, or, or 64, or 65 house car, and we were trying out some things on body, mm -hmm. uh, get a little bit more streamlining. We both read the uh, under 200 mile an hour book, you know, and this thing had a cantilever thing for the radiator, so we got, and it was like a Mustang, you know, set a little tray down there. Anyway. And that was what the car looked like. And Norm had calculated, they never did build it. Norm had calculated 
we'd get the air coming in and it would be heated and, and, and the size of the duct, we got five pounds of boost off each side. Wow. And we did the same thing with the, uh, with the Ford engine for the exhaust in the back. And, but Ted decided to go, or Ted and Aggie, decided to go with another crew, the guy worked at Douglas, and that's the car that they built the 66 Shrike. Hmm. And that was the only one that had the roots blown uh, Drake engine in it. And that's part, I think that's Parnelli in the car. And the thing ran good, uh, they had, we built two cars for them. Uh, they're, they're, that one is, one of them is being restored right now. And we built two cars for them. That led to another project which is that? Oh, a train. That is a train that we built <laughs> at the race car shop. Uh, Tim's did the design. It's very big. Uh, I've got a clipping. I got some newspaper clippings about it. It was propelled by magnet magnetism. Maglev is that? It was. It was the science of maglev science, and this was the first. But this was not levitating. They were thinking about levitating, but this ran on tracks. Steel or rubber wheels? Hmm? Steel. 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 Steel On polished and, and uh, uh, welded and polished track at the 8-mile test track up at Pueblo, Colorado. 200, just a tick under 260 miles an hour. Wow. <laughs> but had two guys in it. Everything else was Everything taken. Everything was, was fuel tank and vehicle, okay. Uh, we put a door in it. Uh, we had to put another door in. And later we put uh, a couple of jump seats in in case some congressman came that wanted to take a ride in it. And then, uh, and then they decided they couldn't get it. it. It didn't accelerate fast enough on magnetism, so they had to get it moving. So one of the jobs I had was we uh, designed a pylon and we put two J57s just to get it rolling. Then they would cut the J57s out and, and switch to magnetic power. That was not a real big problem. It was an easy problem to solve. You know the other one they had to solve? Stopping it. They only had eight miles of test track, and they didn't want to add to it. So we had three of those huge uh, aircraft drag, drag, drug chutes that we deployed. Oh. Three drug chutes, like they used to stop the F-4s, right? And then we had a sky hook, which was an upside-down arresting gear that went up, a hook that went up and caught a cable. <laughs> <laughs> so, so those are, uh, but uh, Ted, Ted Halbrand was a guy, as far as race cars went, uh, safety was his watchword on everything. Everything we made was bulletproof. Uh, he Well, that kind of leads you into... What, to your, that. That's how we got to here. Yeah, uh, I want to know how that... He, because he was the winner... When, when the United States Auto Club decided they were going to, let me see if I can find it. They were going to give a, a safety award for the Continental Casualty Safety Award. Ted was the first guy to win it. And the trophy, which I have a picture of here somewhere, here it is. The trophy is that's in the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum has one of his midget wheels on it. Mm -hmm. But then all the recipients name it. And actually, Halliburton Engineering won it two years. The first year to Ted, and the second year because Ted became the chairman of the USAC Safety Committee. And, and so he told me, he says, okay, but we need a guy like you, so you're the secretary. So he <coughs> and Clarence Cagle were co-chairmen, and I was the secretary, and Halliburton Engineering got it because of the the two of us got it the, the, the second time. And one of the things that, and I've got some examples that you want to see them, but our, somewhere in here, I think I have a, yeah. This is, gives you an idea. This was after Ted had passed away. But this gives you an idea of the people that were on that safety committee. Oh, okay. And we sat in a, we sat in a room a couple, three times a, lot a of year. People. It looks like about 50 people. Yeah, around 40. Yeah, we would we would sit there. I mean, you're lucky. You got Bob Higman, A.J. Watson, uh, Charlie Thompson, who was at the Speedway, uh, Roger McCluskey, Dennis Hundley, who was the NDT non-destructive testing guy. But these were all either Dr. Henry Bach, 
Dave Brown is on there somewhere who was the uh, trackside fire and safety guy. But, you know, and we would brainstorm safety issues, and most of the good stuff that came out were not agenda items, but they were things because Ted would go around the room and ask every guy, did you see anything that needs our attention? And you get people who are on a racetrack or are thinking safety, you can always find something, you know. And we would discuss whether it was worth putting to a board or endorsing as to where they needed a ruling. Yeah. And we were doing this in the 1970s, you know, f- late 60s and early 70s. I think they started that safety committee in 1970. And it was the worst time of the world as far as safety went in racing. Every time, and I, I like to tell people, when I first got involved with race car safety, you could bank on two things. Any time a car hit the fence, there was a big fire, and there were no forty-year-old race drivers. You know, it's all changed. I get, you know, look at that. What Newman did over the weekend. You didn't see a fire, did you? But uh, anyway, so based on that, that put me in touch with the. Uh, with the trackside fire and safety guys and Dr. Bach, and when they were into the uh, getting into a jillion different designs of Indianapolis cars and the cockpits were getting smaller and a whole bunch of things. And Dave Brown, who was a member of that safety committee, one day after the meeting, he said, "Bob, can you do do me a favor? Can you, you know, take a look at the cockpit of a car?" and think about what we have to do and see if you can come up with some way f- to help us get these drivers out of the car. And we talked because, a little bit about it. Huh? Because? Because all the products that were on the market were either straight boards Well, and there was no a way to get crashes, a hold of them. Hmm? When a car crashes, it's like, where is he? He's well, is, is he's there, pretty much in the seat. He's in the seat. Okay. Because they were using the sub, the you know the okay. crotch belts at that time. But so I that driver, they have to cut and because the, of the you know the angle like this, pretty much staying. Of course, you know your body compresses, and no matter if you're in the race for a long time, the the temperature on those heat seat belts, even though they're that wide, you know you, everything stretches. But momentarily, you know, Mm -hmm. you still end up back in the seat. But the uh, incidence of spinal injuries and neck injuries was very high because the helmet started getting heavier Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, jostling around. You you know how much you bounce around in a race car seat. (laughs) And so I gave it uh, some thought. And on the way back uh, in the airplane from that meeting, I'm sitting there, you know, killing time. Uh, we'd flown commercial, so Ted was reading a book or something like that. And I've got a tablet out, and I started sketching, and I come up with this thing. This is like, well, like about our third iteration of it, you know. But I come up with a doc, with a thing like that that could be inserted. This is very thin. Mm-hmm. That could be inserted. Driver's back is against here. It's very strong. You know? what, is, what is it made of? Oh, it's a remarkable material called steel. I've heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the good thing from an engineering standpoint, the good thing about steel, if somebody said, Bob, we're having problems we're, when we lift the boards because we're lifting these people away 250 pounds, I can very, very quickly make a change in that board. I can go either a little bit thicker in gauge, and I can go to a heat trick to a different to a different alloy, and I can do something about it. But it's worked out very well. Uh, so now, what are these slots for? That's for the because the, they do it they, they, from both sides. You put the thing in here. Let me show you a picture here. Put it in here. I got a photograph of an actual rescue here somewhere. Ah, here we go. This is a this is a rescue scene. Uh, this guy's, this driver's from Ventura. This was in the, this is an AP photo that was in uh, the Ventura newspaper. But there's a shoe on. Oh yeah, okay. And and you see, they've got the collar on him already. The doctor got his helmet off. Uh, this guy's a doctor, and he's checking him out, and they're making sure that he that he, he that he's got an airway. 
That's why they pop that helmet off so they can get that mm -hmm. do, it, do something to get an airway going. And they put this thing in, and then they can use his uniform and and and, and the hand slots and hold him rigid. And, and well, do they attach him to the board to the to that board? Sometimes they use a strap to attach him. And I did. Well, what come up keeps with him from? How does it he? When you pull the board out, yeah. What makes him follow the board? This because they're holding him tight against him by using the uniform. They're changing the, this into a splint that, at that time. Okay. They bring him out to this into this attitude here, and then they place him on a longboard, which is the standard rescue device. Now it's, they're, they're not in any tight confines, and then they can slip this out and put it back in a toolbox. Mm -hmm. They use a longboard to put him on the gurney, take him, take him to the. Uh, to the uh, uh, trauma center. Yeah. The IRL, the Dave Brown would do a time timing on them. From the time they put the shoehorn in to the time the guy is on the gurney, 98% of the time is under a minute. Wow, that's bad. And many of these guys with with uh, with, uh, with back injuries and neck injuries. Yeah. We only ended up with one guy that ended up in a wheelchair. That's. Uh, uh, the guy who owns, the, uh, owns the team back there now. Uh, I can't remember his name. He had two, but he ended up, he had two bad accidents within a month or two. Yeah. And, and, so and that was the reason. What is that little knob? This is a head restraint device that I, because uh, uh, I said I've added a lot of parts to it. And let me get this picture up. And show you. These are all the things that Dave had tried, by the way, mm -hmm. at Indianapolis. This was the first thing, you can't even see it. It was a thing called a, a green splint, and it just kept the head stationary. Then they went to the KED, which is a standard for the fire departments. It takes about, and a passenger car takes, oh, a neighborhood 10 to 12 minutes to get somebody out to get that thing, all the straps fastened and everything. Firemen hate it. Then this are two that Dave uh, and his guys tried to do. That's our Mark I shoehorn. That's our Mark II, when we, the first of our IRL boards, and that's this one here. Uh, there's a rundown on. This is from 1987 to 2005. How many guys with, with uh, suspected were diagnosed spinal or neck injuries? That uh, that were rescued. Uh, Steve Schmidt was the guy I was trying to think of. Mm -hmm. This is what I come up with. What's up here is a head restraint. It comes across here. It's got two little screws that hold it on, and it's got a comfort pad on one side and velcro with Velcro on it on the outside of it, and then another one comes over, and that way. After they've got the uh, uh, collar on the guy, the head isn't going to flop around. That's right, and that holds his head down tight against here. These is a, this is a quick, uh, a quick strap arrangement I came up with. This is oriented correctly, is that way, to where one one. Which end is his head at? Hmm? His head's at this end. That's a head end. One guy can take with a carabiner, puts like say the red strap on. Hands it across to the other paramedic, okay? okay? He hooks it here. In the meantime, the guy hooks the blue one here and hands him the blue one. He hooks it here. In between, you see these little buckles? They can cinch him down. Then they put one across the waist. We're going to change that one to where to somehow ties in across the thighs, too. That takes and converts this whole unit into a, a, a this called extrication splint. A spinal splint, because there's no way that spine's going to move when you take. Because we only use those buckles with enough pressure to bring that bring this up against the driver's back and secure okay. it firmly. Okay. So that changes it into a splint. Boy, and you have saved a few lives. Yes, quite a few. And you know you what? Feel the good about greatest that. feeling in the world is when you talk to one of those guys and all they can say is thank you. Yeah. I mean, that changed my whole outlook on everything, you know. That's wonderful. Uh, 
I got a call from Dave and he says, you need to call uh, Jeff Midgley up at, at uh, Salt Lake City. He's got a story to tell you. So I call him. I just sent him a board, you know, a month or so before. Sent him a unit. And I ta got him on the phone. He says, oh, yeah. He said, the you know, I trained my guys on how to use it. And uh, the first night we used it, we made three really hairy rescues. One in a sprint car, one in a late model stalker, and one in a legends car. <laughs> wow. And he, I said, well, how'd they turn out? He says, well, the guy in the sprint car was diagnosed with a hangman's fracture of C2. Now, you know, that's absolutely the worst thing can happen to you. That's, what, 90% of the time is death? And he said the, the doctor that worked on him at the care center when he got there saw a video of the, of, the, of the rescue, and he called one of the paramedics out at the track, and he said, what the hell was that thing that you guys used <laughs> to get him out of that car? And the guy told him, oh, something they call a shoehorn. He says, well, you know something? That saved that guy's life. <laughs> well, I so think I, on that we'll, we'll take a break here. Uh, but I, that that's really incredible. Yeah, yeah. Just, um, Do you want to go into aviation? Yes. So, um, so this thing has been very, very useful, and and it's now in use at, in the race motorsports world. It's in use with uh, IRL, the Racing League, uh, which is uh, fed off to NASCAR, uh, to NHRA, uh, just about every major super speedway in the country because they most of the big speedways have uh, one or two men on staff usually just one guy on staff that's a paramedic that trains off-duty firemen who they hire as independent contractors okay and 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 and, and, and this does fit right into the extrication protocol so it's a very simple I mean you could show them one time and from that time on they know how to do it and Oh, we also uh, have sent, uh, have sent, have sold units to uh, Formula One, and I never see it on TV though. <laughs> they never show the rescues, you know. But no. I did see it actually when John Force hit the fence last year. I did see a guy walk in front of the camera holding a shoehorn. Oh, really? Set it against the wall. Well, they always have it close by in case they need. Right. And Sunday at Talladega, I spotted a guy with something orange, a paramedic, and I looked real close, and it was probably about 10 feet from the car when it was upside down, and he was standing there holding the shoehorn, ready to go. <laughs> but uh, because of its, uh, 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 back in 2005, uh, Indy Racing League, or probably 2004 when they did, Indy Racing League and Delphi Safety decided they were going to give an annual award, much like the, the one that Halbrand won, mm -hmm. uh, for safety and racing safety. I got the first one. That's oh. the trophy. Look what he's holding. <laughs> Look that's, what he's holding. <laughs> so, miniature shoehorn. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. And then right after that, uh, American uh, Association of... No. American Auto Racing Writers and Broadcasters Association, Aruba, they gave me this their Pioneer in Racing Award. Hmm. Which, since I've set a new record here with the length of an interview. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know ever since I heard about that, Yeah. Uh, which I, I don't know how long that's been, but it, from the first model, which was I've when, been working on this thing for 30 years. Have you? Yes, sir. Well, it hasn't been 30 years that I've been... A, yeah. Probably five years or so that I've been, that I've, you know, uh, and I thought, boy, you know, because I could, you know, before grabbing a guy oh. out of the armpits and dragging him out, well, he was okay till we turned his head around, right? <laughs> the old joke, right? Yeah, right. Oh, his head's on backward. Oh, well, let's bring it. <laughs> well, you know, the other thing, Indy Racing League, you know, they've been, uh, well, USAC really, uh, started a big movement in the race car safety uh, of changing a lot of things. Well, like helmets. Crash -worthy fuel helmets system. was one of the first things. And helmets, we but used to, you know, canvas helmets. I mean, oh. 
Well, I remember seeing watching Bill Zaring accidentally step on a Cromwell and put his foot right through it. Oh, I know. I raced, <laughs> I, I wore Cromwell, but they were really good looking. Huh? Yeah, but boy, they were. You but know, don't be in a wreck with uh, one. I had a Lorenz shock shell. That it was a high crown. I didn't like it because if you got a dirt clod, it liked to took your head off, you know. And so I sold it to Lou Spencer <laughs> when he was first starting with the Morgans. I sold it to Lou for fifteen dollars, and I went and bought a Anderson from a guy for fifteen bucks. Uh -huh. And uh, Anderson was a you know, shorty, but it was a low crown helmet, and it was you get hit, it didn't take your head off, you know, it just kind of. Hey, but I'm, a, I'm a bicycle rider, and for years and years, we just wore these little leather. Yeah, yeah. Those yeah, things that look like waffles. Yeah. In fact, the Europeans didn't want to go to, they, they were in love with those, or, or no helmets at all. And I see in some time in the Tour de France, occasionally you'll see a guy with no helmet. Yeah, yeah. And boy, it doesn't take much to bang your head on the ground. It, it's some it's, people you know, have been uh, uh, drug. Uh, are dragged kicking and screaming into safety, into recognizing it. it. There's a whole bunch of things, and just be, there's a lot of serious problems going on right now. Like right now, NASCAR has got a real big problem. They they created a problem with the restrictor plates, where you're taking these cars at 200 miles an hour and putting them two inches apart, and the dynamics that happen with somebody doing the wrong thing at 200 miles an hour just ends up with stuff like Ryan Newman. And when he hits hard enough, and you get a car that's going backwards, and even though the roof flaps come up, they actually created a problem because they made the car go over and upside down, and they landed on the top. You know, those roof flaps that pop up, yeah. when the car's going backwards with four wheels on the ground, they're great. Get him up in the air, you know that, you're a pilot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it does dumb things. It's an aileron. And, and it hit hard enough to where it actually, uh, you know, in his statements, his head was up against the roof when he was sitting on the ground. So that means that the roll cage collapsed around him. And that's, uh, they don't use 4132 tubing, you know, they use uh, Shelby tubing, which is uh, seamless, you know. Yeah. But it's 1020 alloy. And, uh, it's just, uh, uh, you know, they're just, uh, they've got to do something. And one, I think one of the big problems is restrictor plates. I think I know why they like the restrictor plates. It's because right. they, can give, they can give somebody a 32nd of an inch more. <laughs> and he's got a lot more straightaway speed, okay? <laughs> well, if a guy's a you know, friend of the company, so You're speak. right. Safety has been a... Uh, uh they fought it. I can remember when safety belts in cars. I used to, I was like involved in sports cars, but I would, as president of the car club, I would go to rotary clubs mm -hmm. and give lectures on safety and using safety belts. And then, ah! And the Europeans, their attitude was, I don't want to be strapped into a car that's going to go catch on fire. I want to be thrown out of a car. <laughs> that was their attitude. That was, and it was. And and a lot of guys that we raced with, they didn't want they didn't want to use safety belts. Oh they? no no no! They, you know there's a whole, uh, yeah, there's a funny kind of mindset with safety. You know, uh, there was a time in midget racing they wore cloth helmets. Nobody would put on a hard hat. I know. It's crazy. Well, then it went the other way. Floyd Clymer came out. He had these things made in France. They were stamped out of aluminum. And they, his theory was, oh, they get on the racetrack and they slide. But you know what else they do? They dent. <laughs> and, yes. and most out, most organizations outlawed them as a result of that. But it's a, you know, it's a sorting out I forgot Floyd Clyman. What a uh, name out of that. We've tested this with uh, passenger cars, too. Uh -huh. And our, our extrication times, you know, as I showed you with that KED, takes around 10, 12 minutes for two paramedics to get to the, uh, the guy out of the car, or the victim out of the car, this thing here, from the time they slide it in till the time he's on a longboard and on a gurney, is between two minutes and two and a half minutes, depending on if they top the car or, yeah. if, or if they take him out through the door. So that's, and as I was telling the guy, 
The bad thing about it is bulletproof. <laughs> the, worst, the worst thing can happen to it is you drive over it with a fire truck. <laughs> yeah. But if you really need to use it, turn it back over, drive over it again, and you can still It'll use it. It'll be fine. But make sure you take the guy off it before you drive over it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> hey, Robert, thank you very much. Hey, for, you're welcome. For I, appreciate, uh, I appreciate this. And, it's been uh, good fun, and it's been a really fabulous uh, time in our history that you have so beautifully articulated it. Well, I've had a ball. It's a, but it's, you know, you're, you're one of probably a whole lot of young guys that, that grew up at that same time that went through parallel, you know, because this was where it all started, right? That's here. right. You know, and the, the, I think the, you know, the, the, uh, the beauty of it, thanks to him, was getting me from the, some coal mine area of Pennsylvania with my family out here in Southern California, where I could go through that hot rod stage and the car stage, and uh, you know, and I, I belong to uh, automotive historian, Southern California chapter, and uh, and you know, I'm not a guy looking for the Packards, although I appreciate them, but I'm more involved in you know, to the race cars and that kind of stuff, and yeah. I like to see them, and uh, and and we're going to have to we're going to have a meeting out at uh, Tom Malloy's race car collection. This okay. This month sometime. Well, and great. Well, thank you again, and I appreciate your coming over. Yep.